everybody. This is, well, that's me. I'm Lenore von Stein, and this is yet another episode of The Facts. And I'm sitting here with Benita Marcus and John McGuire, uh, two composers of new music. Uh, and uh, we're talking about music. And we were just talking before the, before the cameras came up uh, about um, it, it is, is, is that new music is in a position of, of changing the conversation and you said it wasn't that always true of new music. Mm. Um, and I, I just want to throw this one. I, sometimes I listen, I'm at channel surfing, and I'm listening to, you know, Saturday Night Live or something for a second or something else, and I hear some latest uh, rock, I don't know what they're called now, rock band, I don't know what they call themselves, but some band, you know, that's doing fairly, I, seem, I would immediately, I think, it's going to be pretty pedestrian. And then sometimes I'm struck by the asymmetry that's creeping in to this, to the rhythms, to the, to the, of, of the music, and that's heartening. Mm. Um, and um, so, is, it, it, is new music in the, in the, in the, in the vanguard of the vanguard, or, you know, I don't know what to, put, you know, because you'd said, you know, isn't it always true that new music is kind of outside the mainstream, I think by definition, wouldn't it have to be? Well, uh, think um, of the struggles of Charles Ives or Edgar mm -hmm. Perez. It's been going but on like, for a long Americans. time. these are Americans. I mean, if we looked mm. at the same time period in Europe, we wouldn't, <coughs> we wouldn't be calling it new music or experimental music. I mean, they, they were more experimentalists in a way. Um, they? The Europeans, you mean? No, 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 Charles oh, I, Ives. I, I see what you mean. And, uh, um, so it's t in our country, to some degree, I think the, the definition of music involves a certain kind of uh, experimental approach. Whether the result is exper experimental or not is a different thing, but um, a, a very open approach. By experimental, you mean I, I, I get into fights. I've gotten into fights with people on New Music Box when they said my work was experimental, and I said, how can a how can an artist be doing anything but experimenting? I mean, it's it's all experimental. So how can it be experimental? Doesn't it? This <laughs> other people take exactly the opposite tack. Like Barres says, I'm never exper. I do all my experimenting at home, and when the music is done, it's not an experiment anymore. It's finished. Yeah, I would agree with so, that. So, um, experimenting is. <laughs> it's not. I don't. When I teach uh, and I work, I always mm. start with brainstorming, which I consider a type of experimenting. Mm. And all the aspects of what could be in the piece, I just throw it out there as fast as possible. And um, I always do what I call research. And the research is to consider every single possibility. And I think when we're considering every single possibility and uh, then selecting what works as opposed to what doesn't work, then that's a type of experimentalism, but John Cage wouldn't agree with what it. What do you mean by every type of possibility? Well, let's say uh, uh, you have four pitches and you want to try to put them uh, on the vertical. You could put them close together, you could put them far apart. I see. So you consider, every, you could put them in different registers, you could invert the pitches. So you have so. a very close definition first, and then you, then you find yes. out all the all the variants that could all take the place variations within this, within yes. this close. And Zanakis worked that way. I mean, mm -hmm. he did it. He and Cage worked that way. I mean, they generated material either via the I Ching or the computer. But they always had more material than they needed, and mm -hmm. they selected what they wanted. I think Bach worked that way too, didn't he? I think a lot. I think that's how <laughs> composers work. <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah. So, um, or they have worked up until this time. How do you work? <clears throat> Is that how you work? That's how I work, yes. Hmm. Absolutely. And do you think that's influenced by um, your uh, practice of counterpoint? 
that you work yes. that way? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Because mm. with counterpoint, as you go from just putting one note against another to the next, to the next, to the next, you really have to consider every pitch that could work there mm. and in what register would those pitches be in and everything. So, yeah, it is an aspect of counterpoint, absolutely. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and is that how you work, too? Uh-huh. I think we've all been infected by this, <laughs> by this same tradition. Yeah, I, I did a lot of counterpoint practice, too. Mm -hmm. And so but, did Cage. Yes. And I studied <clears throat> counterpoint, the old Viennese style, when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. years and years of it. And so, in a way, I was trained like a European. Mm -hmm. And I was trained by a European in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, but um, <coughs> he could not teach me composition. Because uh, even though he knew everything that led up to composition, when it actually became time to compose, he didn't know what to do. Mm. And um, so, he, was he a composer himself? I don't know. Was he a oh. theory person, or he was getting a PhD in theory? Yeah, mm. he was from Austria. But what I'm, I'm trying to get to is that uh, the same education you could get in Europe, and not write new music, if you know what I mean. Because of the because of the this this long historical uh, culture, uh, Western civilization, uh, sort of hanging over their heads all the time. Mm -hmm. Here we don't feel that that sense of history so much. Uh, actually, we we've actually gone uh, to the other extreme where uh, any sense of history is almost like uh, bad news in your piece. Hmm. And so unless you're in, uh, unless you're in academia, yes, where it becomes a kind of requirement. In yes, your you have to justify it. Yeah, justify everything you do. Well, justify it in academic terms too. Yes, yes. And to be a composer <laughs> is is another kind of performer. That writing music is a performance, and that you have to think about it as a performance because ultimately that's what's going to happen. And so if you're bound up with justifying academically what you're doing, you're getting really far away from the idea of performing. Mm. So, so, I mean, it seems to me that there's a, a problem with the modern music in America being so wrapped up with academia. I mean, it, there's hardly any other place to play it, hardly any other place to, to develop, hardly any other, and, 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 and that's one of the issues with the level of innovation, or uh, that it, it's 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 still like in the academy all the time here because there's so little support, so little government support, so little funding support. Otherwise, I don't know. What do you think? You don't, I don't think you think I'm right. Well, um, yeah, actually, I agree with you, but uh, I would say it a little differently because academia on the West Coast and academia on the East Coast are two different things, but they have the same result. Uh, I taught at Cal Arts for a while, <coughs> and everybody's expected to be really crazy and experimental there and off the wall, and that's their sense of what academia should be, but they, you know, they're always strugg struggling just to get accreditation at their school mm. because of it. And I was teaching an orchestration there, and um, no interest, absolutely no interest in it. I mean, it was just all fun and games. Whereas you're at Columbia, you could speak about that. And it's another kind <coughs> of academia that you have to follow certain <laughs> rules, but it's completely different than what you would get at Cal Arts, for instance. But very similar to what you would get at UC Berkeley, which is uh, also on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty much uh, coastal. I think I think Cal Arts is a real kind of exceptional situation, as far as I as far as I know. But they tend to turn out people that are very very similar. Pardon me. They tend to turn out people that are very very similar, which you know. You mean UC Berkeley and Cal Arts? No, no, just Cal Arts. Oh, oh, oh okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Huh, depressing. Uh, that's a, a depressing term, turn out people. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Brooklyn College, to the Conservatory of Music at Brooklyn College, mm -hmm. where I got a master's, and the people that were at the head of the department and many people in the department, they were composers. Uh, I guess uh, every semester there were composers' concerts, and they never came. 
They could care less about what the composers were doing. They had a really <laughs> attitude towards You mean the, 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 the faculty would yeah. come to their yeah. colleagues' yeah. concerts? Oh, yeah. I see. The faculty wouldn't come to the student concerts oh, I of, see. of composer concerts. They would, I, I, I would imagine they would, more of them, I know, more of them would come to the, to the performance things when they were playing, you know, Beethoven's this, that, and the other thing. You know, they would come to that, but they wouldn't come to see the composers. Hmm. That's kind of a depressing situation. Very depressing. Yeah. It, it I used to, to teach at that. Brooklyn College. I was there <coughs> for a while. But um, when I was there, the department was run by a composer. Um, Dorothy Klotzman, mm -hmm. and uh, she only hired composers. She loved composers. She said, composers know everything. <laughs> they can teach theory, math, his history, whatever. They know everything. And so there's some truth to that, I think. And we really do have to know quite a bit mm. if we're going to proceed uh, in a big way. Um, I, remember the the story. Uh, well, I know you remember because we just talked about it. Um, the story of, of of we were talking about the difference in the way uh, uh, the cultural conversation in the United States and the cultural conversation in Germany or in, or in Europe, in Europe, London in this particular mm -hmm. case. And there was a piece of Coggles that was <coughs> that Beth Griffith, your your wife and wonderful mm -hmm. soprano, who's in my ensemble as well, lucky enough. Mm -hmm. uh, was uh, had done a was doing a premiere here in New York, or a presentation or a, a piece of Coggles here, and yeah, people didn't pay attention know, to it. As far as I know, it was an American premiere. American piece premiere. By Coggle, yeah. And it was completely not paid attention to by by American critics, by American newspapers, by American cultural writers, whereas it was a big thing in Germany or in London. Uh, well, of course, it was a big thing in Germany because Cottle lived there. And, uh, but but she did it in London, and uh, it was a, it was a big deal. I mean, all the all the prominent London critics came. I think the very next day there were four newspapers with long discussions of this performance. But here, she she did the perform the same performance. I took the trouble to print out invitations and sent them a week early to all the critics in New York. Uh, that I, whose, whose names I could find out. That was at Roulette, and uh, Jim Staley at Roulette has, has those names. And not one came. Not one came to this uh, Coggle premiere, one of his very best and most important pieces. At which point I, I kind of started to give up on New York, frankly. I thought, this is a place that seems to think of itself as some kind of world center. And I said, what? <laughs> That's Maybe not the not behavior. Music. That's not the behavior of a world center, not by a long way. It's okay. kind of a, the behavior of a province. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you compare even our, our things like the New York Philharmonic to orchestras in Europe, and um, uh, this, my experience with the New York Philharmonic is basically they don't like to play modern music. Oh, they only have, I think they only have one modern piece in their repertoire. The and you can really and hear it when they play it. You can really hear their, their attitude or their, their, their not, maybe not their attitude, their, just their out of touchness or something. Yeah, I think it's more out of touch. Um, I've conducted a lot of works by Martin Feldman, and I was present when the premiere of Coptic Liked was done, he wrote it for the New York Philharmonic, it was performed by them, it was conducted by um, Gunther Schuller, uh. and it was horrible. It was a horrible, horrible performance. I totally did not get the idea of the piece. And I, in a, as a conductor, I cannot blame the performance. I have to blame the conductor. Because it's really the conductor's responsibility to get the idea of the music across to the performers and what their job is to make the piece work. Mm -hmm. And also to make them excited about playing the piece. That this is a fun thing, that there's, there's things here that are really new and interesting. And, um, you know, Gunther Schuller did not do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when Morty walked on stage uh, during the applause, the whole violin section booed him. No kidding? Yeah. You mean they were boo like that? Well, uh, loud enough that people could hear. Shit. <laughs> Unbelievable, huh? 
And, but, you know, it, but that was a prejudice that I think would not have been there had there been a different conductor. Certainly, that's, that's a conductor's fault. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. So uh, how did the conductor undertake to do the piece in the first place? You know? I, uh, who knows? I mean, Jacob Druckmann was the person who programmed the concert. Uh -huh. So maybe it was some relationship there. I see. Okay. Uh, Let's talk about. I got this list here. It's, it's getting <laughs> mighty skinny here. Uh, that won't stop us. So that won't stop us, right? Um, <coughs> what are you focusing on? The importance of focus in the process. Uh, well, we talked about that a, a few episodes ago about not having the roiling and 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 uh, so that you can. Um, uh, you can calm. You need a calm place in which to, mm. in which to uh, do stuff. Over the years, because there was many years where I didn't have a private place, and so I got used to making this, you know, just cutting off, and no matter what was going on around me, I just would work, because mm. uh, one had to. And um, so, um, uh, well, you had mentioned also that, that I was talking about uh, that new music was uh, verboten in East Germany because they thought it was a decadent uh, da da da. Yeah, it was. It was not performed in, in uh, German Democratic Republic because it was. They had all this political stuff, you know, Stalinism and so forth. This was Western decadence, and they were contrasting, of course, with West Germany where it was a big deal and. Was very well financed. So, so, so we we know we know that uh, that chapter is over pretty much, though. But mm. but the, the 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 continuing chapter of parochialism in in the arts or the way it's looked at the arts. I mean, when you told me that story, what flashed in my mind was the picture of uh, the the paintings of Nixon's daughters <laughs> that were at one time that were 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 it's, they were incredibly bad. They were uh, and and. Um, it's they the same, you know. It, 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 it's it's the same thing on the right. This kind of, you know, as it was on this kind of right left. You know, Stalin. Who, you know, is he on the left? I don't know really what he is. But the uh, the 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 uh, this this he's dead. He's yeah. dead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this this um, cutting out of the 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 details in the conversation or whatever it is that this that this these these more expressive art forms you know reveal by these um, you know stalin nixon uh, bush uh, uh, so that <coughs> Well, you know, I'm not saying anything we haven't said before. So that pat answers become more um, the only thing that's on the table, the, the only thing that's it's there. It's safe. Yeah, I mean, you... It's you, safe. Yeah, because they're all, you know, let's face it, art is subversive. It's subversive to the, the mainstream culture that we have. And not subversive in a bad way. Subversive in a good way. By introducing new ideas, by uh, by um, <clears throat> what would you say, um, challenging the norm, by the vision of the artists, but nothing else. So you come up with a good definition of innovation in art, then. That's, oh, I that's did? what it, you just did, yeah. But what what was it? Tell us uh, again. <laughs> tell well, us. No, you tell it. I don't again. know. You, I didn't even just, realize I was doing it. <laughs> you just did so well. Sorry, I don't. I didn't take notes, but it's all uh, all been recorded. I'm sorry. You can just play the tape hey, back hey, five hey, minutes. Hey, hey, <laughs> hey. Uh, I mean, the for instance, with the. Uh, as, as we tape this, it's uh, uh, um, Occupy Wall Street time, and the uh, the the reaction to it, or not just the reaction to it. I, I mean, the good thing about it is that it's engendered so much reaction. One of the good things, you know, people are talking. You know, it reminds me of the good old days when the, the conversations were a little fiercer, um, and um, the. 
the, the, the callousness of the, I, I stood with them. One day I went down and stood with them and the bankers that walked by and the different people that, I don't know if they're all bankers, but they're nicely dressed, some of them. And the, and then I was at a par your party and somebody was telling me, who's a lawyer down there, of the, he was talking about the people that he works with and their attitudes towards them. And I, and I know somebody who said, oh, it's just a fringe group. And, and um, the, the, this combination of ignorance and callousness that, that is um, sort of coin of the realm and, and, uh, and is, is supported is by a culture that supports it, you know, that there haven't been other cultural, in, you know, there haven't been enough other cultural inroads, you know, art is the subversive. There isn't enough chance for the subversive, you know, punching enough activity, punching through the bag uh, to, to do their part in moving this conversation along, this, 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 um, I mean, sometimes when you're, I mean, I grew up in a political <coughs> household, and, and, and sometimes it you know, the, wasn't true of my parents, but often kind of sloganizing, which is an easy thing to fall into, and sloganizing art that goes along with it, you know, propagandistic or, or um, I mean, I watch Democracy Now!, which I'm really very fond of, but I don't think she's ever had a serious artist on Democracy Now!, you know, not a serious musician anyway. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's all bum da bum da bum da bum da bum da bum you know, uh, come on. Mm -hmm. It's like the door suddenly, you know, is closed on the, the, um, the quality, you know, the, the, the other qualities of uh, expression and... It's very sad. Because there is so much ignorance in our country. And this ignorance is, of course, leading to all the financial problems that we have today. Uh, but it, it's also, I particularly see it in young people, especially young people who are isolated in small towns and places like that, where they don't have options. And because they are not educated, because their schools are not giving them a variety of things to choose from, and because maybe their parents are square or <laughs> just out deer hunting or something, um, they don't, um, I just see over and over again, uh, kids in small towns, I have sisters that live in small towns, by the time they're 18 or 19, they're on drugs, they're on heroin, they're committing suicide. Uh, they just, and it's all because they don't know that there are options and other ways to live in the world. <coughs> and that's why so many of us leave our hometowns and come to New York, because we know there are options and they're not available in our hometowns. And we want those options. We need those options. We need those options to survive mm -hmm. as a creative individual. So listen, well, fine art is like a like a vault of options. It's it's just mm. chalky block full of <laughs> full of full of full Ch of options uh, that um, so you you know help you, um, you know, because there's all endless ways to do anything, mm -hmm. but there certainly are a lot of walls, a lot of barriers to, uh, to understanding that, to moving ahead. But, but, um, so what do you do about it? Uh, um, you asked the question about focus. <laughs> do you have some way of narrowing down these, all these options? When you, when you speak of focus, I assume that, that that's what you're talking about. Focus in terms of fo when I'm focusing on what I'm doing. Or yeah, focusing on the process of composing is what I'm what I'm assuming that, that you're talking mm -hmm. about when you mention focus. Yeah, <coughs> I think that's a very good way to put it. I, well, I, 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 I haven't get, put I, anything yet. I'm just asking. Well, I, I, get, I get lost. <laughs> I get. I get. I get. I get. I, I'm writing a piece right now for viola, and I and yeah. I've never written for viola before. But solo viola, viola, and uh, yeah. And uh, and uh, first I started. It was my process. First I started thinking about. I know this violist because she's in my ensemble, and uh, sort of writing, you know, 
trying to hear her or, or listen for her or feel her. And then very quickly I realized, I, I don't know her well enough to, I don't know. <laughs> and um, so then I decided, well, write about, because I always write about things that, um, I'm always focusing on things that um, disturb me. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, uh, they, go on. They, they upset me, and when I write a piece that, um, you know, op cracks open a door a little bit that I haven't been able to or something, it, 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 I do it because it makes me feel better. And um, so, um, so I, I started to do that, and then, and then there was something you said, and I can't remember it now, in a converse or listening to the sounds and letting the sounds um, dictate the, the, the music that you were listening to the sounds, and I thought, I should be listening to these sounds more in my head, and I know where they were, and, and, um. They're over here. They're over here. <laughs> no, and, they're right uh, here. Oh, 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 here they are, okay. So I'm, I'm, um, so anyway, what I'm focusing on, and, and very quickly in the course of writing a piece, whatever I'm focusing on, somewhere maybe the second week or something, usually it takes me quite a while, disappears. <laughs> and then the kind of the piece begins, to, uh, it's, uh, this piece has already done that, it, it begins to take shape and I'll say, I'll be darned, this thing has a shape, of who knew, not me. <laughs> and, oh, sure. uh, and then it's, then it's, Editing and then it's you know seeing you know it's I'm it's you know it's really beat by beat you know uh, what the you know this really doesn't work do I need this here we have one minute one of the things I learned from Samuel Beckett whose piece I did I took a 45 minute piece of his and I that spent five years doing this piece or more but one of the things I learned from him was that every and every comma every but was justified from several different directions so mm -hmm. that it looked like it, it was like a piece of nature. And um, so I take that with me in the editing process. This, is there really a purpose for this here? Uh, and you know, you know how it is, like you, you sort of love it for a while and then you, you, know, you realize, you know, no. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, How I make music. <laughs> um. Well, that's really quite cool about your focus first on something that disturbs you. Really that sounds like uh, the process of the, the what is that the the, the the fish that makes pearls. Oysters. Oysters because there's yes, a piece of sand in there. There's a the piece of sand that, yeah. that causes an irritation but and results in a pearl. Sorry about oh, the no, fish. Oh, we've got we've got we've got to wind up this conversation. Uh, uh, can I Thirty just seconds. say um, that I think uh, to me music is an experience that you you live through. It's a very human experience, and I think what you're saying and your process that you start with something that irritates you, and then you sort of experience it and see where it takes you, and um, and that's what an audience wants to hear. Okay, so here we go. I hope you want to hear it. Good night. <laughs>